Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How y'all doing? Good. Wonderful conference. Uh, really happy to be here and happy to be around people that are resonating so well. Uh, thanks. Uh, so I'm going to be moving around a pretty big territory. Uh, basically, I'm going to summarize this as uh, <coughs> An exploration of eco-cultural restoration by collectively translocating carbon strategically to restore biodiversity, climate resilience, food, water, energy security, and health. In essence, uh, restoring our relationship to the living world. And uh, so I'm going to uh, take a little bit of a risk and uh, talk, about the, talk about psychology a little bit. And, and I'm not a psychologist, but I have watched my own mind through the years and, and basically moving through coming from suburbia and this civilization and traveling through many different ecosystems and stripping a lot of things away and uh, understanding the process that we're going through and the time that we're in. So uh, the first piece I guess I'd like to talk about is uh, I have kind of a deal with myself about optimism. I consider myself an optimist, but the deal is that it can't be based in denial. And, and that's, that's a tough, that's a tough edge. Uh, so uh, along those lines, um, I'm going to try to say this in a way that you have to reserve the first part of what I say in terms of judgment or being affected by it, that's possible. Uh, and, and wait until the second piece to let it sink in, if you could. And that is, we don't really, if we're honest, we don't really know anything for certain. We basically can reduce it to odds. And, you know, we could say that, you know, the odds are very good the sun's going to come up tomorrow and so forth. Uh, if we're really honest with where we are right now, a given population, climate, uh, you know, deforest, you know all these things. I'm not going to give too long of a list. But uh, the odds aren't that good of us making it. Reserve your judgment. Uh, <clears throat> the second piece is that if we were to pay attention, really, at any point in our lives, looking up at the night sky, looking at life in general on this planet and the rareness of it and the fact that we're here to do this work, uh, we've been beating those odds every second of our lives. So we should expect miracles. <clears throat> That's the part that counterbalances the first part for me. <laughs> Hopefully it does to you. Uh, the other piece to uh, just sort of try to understand my process a little bit, I, um, I've got to kind of go back to my childhood and look at how uh, this piece works in terms of, I think almost all children are curious. And I certainly was. And I had a, uh, a real attraction <coughs> and curiosity with nature and the natural world. I was lucky to have parents who pointed me in the right direction in terms of observation skills. Uh, my mother is an artist, so there was this aesthetic eye towards aesthetics. And if you went to Guido's talk yesterday, he talked about fractal uh, dimensionality, 1.4 to 5, and there's this uh, kind of joy uh, attraction there. And uh, that's kind of where I'm heading to in terms of biophilia eventually. Uh, <clears throat> but. The other piece of it was my father was a scientist and got a, a very good eye towards the best end of scientific uh, analysis or uh, observation. So those things basically moved toward looking at the world, experiencing beauty in cases like seeing my first brook trout or dipping a net into a pond and seeing a, a painted turtle or I was about 10 years old and coming home at night one night in the car through some big oak trees uh, on the lake where I lived and I, I had a, a tree house and so as a 10 year old kid my eye naturally in the headlights went to the tree house and a snowy owl's head popped out of it and <laughs> leaped out and three three big uh, wing beats and it was out over the lake and, and it was all lit up and I mean that obviously takes you to this kind of speechless place which is kind of where I'm heading so from there you're into this sense of wonder and I feel like eventually all these things that gravitate in, in a sequence uh, into gratitude and then into reverence 
it brings eventually the heart into play, into the observation skills in the mind. And through that, that heart experience uh, moves into compassion, uh, inclusivity, reciprocity, and stewardship. And then that takes us to restoration, and that's kind of the theme here. So I just kind of wanted to talk a little bit about the inner process, because we tend to be talking about uh, the outer world and carbon, which we're going to get into, but I uh, wanted to preface it with, with that. And that kind of takes us into quality. <clears throat> uh, we've been talking about quality for food, we're talking about uh, the gizmo, and uh, it tends in my mind to be focused on us or whoever's going to eat it. But the part I struggle with is having, uh, is quality for who? And how do we make this, eventually get this process to where it's, it's quality for all beings, you know, in the largest sense. And I think that's where we kind of need to go here to get to the level of restoration that, um, that I'm heading toward. Um, so I love this piece by Alda Leopold. He, he's, you may be familiar with this, but it's one of my favorite one-liners, which is, the first law of intelligent tinkering is to save all the parts. <laughs> so as we're interacting with this you know, wondrous process of life and figuring out our role in it and what we do with this uh, situation that I, you know, we're in, we're in the sixth extinction spasm of the history of this planet and we're causing it. And so we've got to kind of get around this set of issues somehow to move into, you know, pass through the guilt and, and all the rest of the emotional baggage that comes with it. And um, that's not easy, um, but I think that what I love about the, this first law of intelligent tinkering is to save all the parts is that it, it salvages the curiosity part, but it gives it some ethical and uh, it's some boundaries that we have to do. We, you know, if you want to study a butterfly, you don't pull its wings off so it can't fly, right, kind of thing, and, and, and in, in the larger system sense as well. Um, so, if you're all the time, you can just I found myself at 17 if you're uh, all the time, you can just back on a trip, a, a 15,000 mile trip across the country into away. deserts and mountains and kind of a walkabout, doing my own uh, version of a walkabout, <laughs> not having a, a cultural uh, ritual to go through with that. And it kind of culminated in the back country in the Teton Mountains uh, with what I can only describe as a peak experience or a full con I just want to say that because there tends to be sometimes a bit of a clinical um, uh -oh. you might need to there tends to be you know a, I think we tend to think about carbon uh, just to, like get it out of the atmosphere. And, well, what is that carbon? You know, it's like all these, all these beings that uh, all the soil creatures and all of the whales and great herds of animals that have been converted into atmospheric carbon is really what we're talking about. And uh, if we look at restoring the habitat of these beings, we can kind of bring them home, uh, the ones that aren't extinct anyway. So. Uh, Let me, let me just run through a, a few things about comfort levels. Uh, I think a lot of this gets into what we're comfortable with. And I, a lot of people tend to be more comfortable with a mowed lawn than some kind of a chaotic, wild system. And we have to get over that. You know, it's, it's a very real thing. And what is it that is really behind that, uh, this inability to be comfortable in wild systems? Uh, and so the Buddhists talk about small mind and big mind, and I see a, uh, this, trans, this transition from small mind or egocentric to big mind and biocentric. And so on the one side, you'd have this feeling of separateness. On the other side, uh, kind of an uh, interdependent diversity, uh, wholeness. Um, on, the other, on the small side, uh, you'd have fear, hoarding, and greed would be logical outcomes of that. Um, on the, trans, on the transform side, you'd have this wonder, respect, gratitude, the things that I mentioned before, uh, linear, 
to cyclical, short-term to long-term, mechanistic <coughs> to organic, alive, <coughs> holistic, and relationships. Also, the mechanistic goes with reductionistic. Uh, there tends to be a, kind of a, an external God in the religious <coughs> beliefs um, where once you go through that transition, it's, it's pretty much divinity within now, um, goes from centralized to decentralized, competitive to cooperative. Uh, and so you get the point. Anyway, the, the, all these things are necessary in order for us to get to be comfortable with the kind of wildness and diversity that we're, that we require in the end. You know, it, it, you could get there just by thinking about a, an enlightened self-interest. But uh, however we get there, we, we really need to uh, get diversity into these systems um, and resilience. And so we're in a special time where we're deep into um, new territory in terms of uh, conditions on this planet. We've never seen them in our present bodies. Uh, so um, carbon, uh, it's, it's the DNA, it's the, it's the, the stuff. And we're going to be talking a fair bit about trees. Let's see if this works. So yeah, the spirit rides the horse of matter. I just wanted to kind of get to the, uh, the territory and what's moved me. And, and part of this is what, uh, what keeps you going for the rest of your life. You know, if you, if, if you get into this stuff and you get to the point where you're motivated to change because you're afraid that we're going to go extinct or we're going to you know, suffer or whatever, then that's short term. You, you generally don't stick with it. You get out of, you get into a perception where you're out of danger and you lose it. But you, if you get to the point where you really connect, it, uh, it, it's, it's with you for life. You don't stick with it and be patient and all the things that, that are required to really keep going. Um, so these are, are miraculous um, expressions of life that we're talking about. And somehow we need to get up to speed with what they have to say to us. All right, so <clears throat> somewhere not too long after I came back from, the, uh, from that trip in the Tetons, I graduated from high school. I met a backcountry ranger there who told me about this little school in southern Ohio uh, where he went to school to be a backcountry ranger. It was really the first career type of thing that I could relate to. And I was kind of blown away that you could actually get paid to be out there doing that stuff. So uh, within weeks of um, getting out of high school, I was enrolled in this program uh, in wildlife biology. I think I might turn this on until we're ready here. Um, and I guess the next revelation for me was I started studying habitats of animals, and one by one, and then collectively in bigger and bigger groups, looking at the, the, the dynamics of the habitat and what you could do to raise and lower the the life support for that species, numbers and quality of life. And uh, that just kind of blew me away, this, this term called carrying capacity, that the land is not fixed in what it can support, and that we can, that's where, that's the, where this, this place where we can be stewards and we can have the effect, uh, positive effects that we're really uh, wanting. And uh, so I went through all that, I went through a process of, you know, bigger and bigger composites of species, I hadn't really included the soil properly yet. That came later. You know, I was dazzled by what I could see at that time in my life. I was in my early 20s. And so I, I got uh, pretty far into it and um, started, uh, at, I should say, simultaneously I was uh, living on a piece of property that eventually co-founded a, a community <laughs> land trust. So we're going to also be getting into the the interhuman collective community of what uh, the leverage points that we can get to by working together as opposed to everybody being separate. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a really big piece. And I'll, I'll mm -hmm. talk about freedom as well, and, and that has in its relationship to debt and how you work your way out of that. So I just <laughs> stripped it all off. I mean, I was I was learning bird calls and animal tracks and every plant and every mushroom and every, so I had to be immersed in it. So I cut some TV poles and, and moved into the woods for. 10 years without uh, running water or electricity or a phone, and that was just dandy for me. Uh, but it, what, it, what it did is it allowed me to use the little money that I had to pay off the land and then drill wells and cisterns and sort of a process of moving my way out of having to pay rent, having to have bills to pay, 
and that took me years to create the freedom that I needed to do what I wanted to do. Um, unless you have a lot of money, it's just the way you have to think about it. <clears throat> so, uh, I mean, living on that property, learning beekeeping and gardening and planting my orchards and, and getting set up there, began to be aware of the rate of extinction and pretty, uh, pretty wound up about a lot of that and started studying tropical forest systems and wondered, you know, where do you put your shoulder to the wheel in a time like this? And the tropical forest started to interest me very much. And at least as much the indigenous cultures that I, I needed reference points. And that's kind of where I'm at now is like a uh, <clears throat> reference points for ecologies, reference points for cultures, and, I de and ideally the connection between the two. Eventually I would come to look at um, the relationship between cultural diversity and biological diversity. <clears throat> We'll get into it a little bit about where this comes from, but I was—I had this experience in, in Guatemala after working there for many years in southern Belize, where we'll be talking about where you know friends of mine that knew 300 plants off the top of their head that could make any you know get any medicine or food or building material and their entire life out of that set of species and, then, and knowing what to do with it, uh, but they were work, you know they were working in uh, banana plantations. And when they opened their window in the morning, all you could see is a monoculture of bananas for as far as you could walk in, in hours. And so you couldn't access that knowledge, right? You have to have both to come together to make this work. On the other end, I see people driving, you know, 70, 80 miles an hour past landscapes with all of those same functions, but they have zero idea and if, what to do with it. And if their car ran out of gas, they might die in place. So there, there's this... There's, there's this connectivity that has to happen, but the two have to meet. And um, so we really need to kind of look at and balance that. Um, so I took my first trip to Central America and found myself in a remote uh, area. Uh, I was looking at some of the temple sites, the Mayan temple sites, and a number of things came about that uh, I just really got into working with some farmers there. and. Uh, beginning to pull it all back, you know, shedding off everything I knew from up here. Uh, and what I mean by that is that um, one of the hardest things to see through when you're in it your whole life is the subsidies that are changing the way we look at things. Um, you know, our agriculture is kind of blind because it's got access to 10 to 20 calories of energy for everyone you make back. And, then you can think that you did something constructive or something because you've got the, you know, you've got this food that is a, a tenth or a twentieth of, of what you've burned. Uh, it's hidden. So you've got the you've got the petroleum products, then you've got essentially slave labor from all over the world flowing in because of the relationship of our currencies. And and then on top of all that, you've got the soil. You know, you got this this big bank of soil under you that uh, <clears throat> we're wearing down, but it looks like it, you know, if you don't have a long enough view, and, and that's part of this compatibility as well, is we really need to uh, take a longer view. I think we could maybe even save capitalism if, if capitalism had a 2,000-year window of the war, and particularly if, it, if the capital, uh, if the currency was based on actual capital, uh, natural capital. We'll talk about that. Um, so I eventually purchased uh, and co-founded a uh, an agroforestry research center. I was into permaculture, but I didn't really want to have to explain that every time, and I figured agroforestry was pretty self-evident. Um, and I began to work with an old planting on a uh, classic Mayan city site, about 13 hills with chocolate that had been planted, cacao, uh, 30, uh, no, more, like 100 years before, I think, in some cases. And I was working with regenerating that, cutting it back, letting it sprout, and, there was already a beautiful, uh, well, actually, we can get back into this now. Um, a very nice situation with large <coughs> technicalities, not my specialty. You want IT, Mark? Uh, maybe. Okay. I, I, I seem to have done it last time, but I don't know what's. Uh, 
There we go. All right, all right, we're good. <clears throat> so for folks that have, let's see, we have a pointer. The black one. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> sorry, release is, is down here, yes. and uh, the way you get into this place is by dugout canoe. There's no roads going in, it. so you know pretty quickly you're leaving your thoughts behind. All these big ideas that you have that are based on money or technology or you know anything that. Uh, that you think you know, it, you got to dig real deep. And you have to reassess. Uh, it's really a, a kind of an extraordinary place. But what I was getting at was that the, the cacao, the old cacao trees. When I first saw uh, a cacao tree with pods on it that you could pick and make chocolate out of, underneath of a, a Spanish cedar or mahogany this big, I thought mm. uh, this is amazing because of a lot of reasons, but. But I had been thinking about economics <clears throat> in, a, in a kind of a simple sense. One of the challenges that we have is to be able to discern the difference between principle and interest in the biological account. You know, how do you know that what you're harvesting that you could continue to do? You know, I, I'll tell you why I don't use sustainability anymore in a little bit, but uh, th that you could continue to do without wearing down your principle. And so the forest, the big trees, the, the whole nutrient cycling system, which is kind of miraculous when you get into tropical forests, because they don't have anything to lean on. They don't have these deep soils. They don't have, you can't use any inputs. You don't have uh, uh, access to any other subsidies. So all you have is pure design and a machete. <laughs> and what, what's really interesting is that uh, you know, this image had come to me about you know, up here we have bank accounts and we have a credit card and we draw on it, but down there it really is pretty much you've got a machete as a card card and your bank account is between your ears. And so you, you get into this incredible amount of knowledge that's required to know all these species, not, not just to discern the difference between them, but what the uses are, what eats them, what's the pollinators, and, and it's literally endless. It took me 20 years to basically get to uh, about 200 species along those lines and get them down through five languages and figure out uh, you know all, all those details of this ethnobotanical information so um, but in the process I was kind of working with what I had there with this nice you know mature core area of cacao growing there was other things in there lots of lots of, of things but that was the main crop so I was interplanting uh, lots of varieties of coffees and gingers and turmerics and mangoes and avocados. And too many things to mention really right now, but uh, stacked it pretty nicely um, over time. Let's see what else do we got here. Uh, it's an amazing area. It's actually, uh, you know, in, in terms of trying to select where to start, there's all this tropical diversity, so that, that was impressive. But even so, uh, in this area is, is what they call a Pleistocene refugia, which during ice ages, a lot of the land around it turns into savannas because they can't be, it can't support the, the temperatures and the, and the rainfall. There's these pockets that hold all the species in these rainforests, kind of like a, a, a pool in the stream during a drought that the fish, you know, gulp air and wait for the next rain. And uh, so, this area is is really impressive. Like behind. The farm is a you know, there's a whole series of Indian villages or along the certain elevations, like right about where we are. But then going behind us is about 90 miles of uninhabited, uh, beautiful wild land, and it's full of caves. It's underlaid with caves and underground rivers and all kinds of uh, ancient cities that haven't been discovered yet. <laughs> it's just mysterious and wild, and you hear all these local beliefs about spirits and. Uh, I almost wanted to write a, uh, uh, a field guide to nature spirits at one point because there's so many of them and they're so interesting. And, and from a distance, you can kind of think that that's quaint or you know, write it off as something you know lesser. But when you're back in here in the, in the middle of the night in these underground caves with you know rivers, waterfalls, and you know, underground you can walk for miles in them, and things happen that you can't really categorize uh, in your previous life. And I was really kind of wanting and needing that. <clears throat> uh, so anyway, this is one of the caves when we hiked back 
20 miles or so in. The, ironically, water is not easy to come by in the dry season with all that rain, 200 inches of rain, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, it almost all comes, you know, half of that comes in a three month period of the summer. And then it hits these limestone layers and there's a, a 2 million year limestone, a 50 million year layer limestone, a 150 million year limestone. And when you go back into these caves, you're kind of going back in time and there's petrified bones and uh, all kinds of interesting things. It's very Tolkien-like in a lot of ways. Um, but this is where we camp because there's an underground lake and a river to, to endless water. So this is kind of a northernmost range of this type of hardwood, uh, or, you know, rainforest type. It gets kind of scrubby by the time you get to the Yucatan. We're about 300 miles south of there. Uh, but it becomes like the template. I, this is the reference ecosystem that I'm referring to right at the moment. And the culture there is the reference culture. Now, there's lots of them you can pick, but it's handy to have a functional reference point when you're navigating to where you think you want to go. The, the thing that I've seen, the mistake I've seen uh, by lots of well-meaning people is um, you improve on the status quo and you can see real clear improvement, but it's like so dysfunctional that you've just got a little bit less dysfunctional. And so in order to know where we're really going, you kind of got to turn around the whole opposite direction, look at the other end of the spectrum, and then work your ass off to get toward that for the rest of your life. And so the functioning that's happening in here in terms of nutrient cycling, in terms of buffering the intensity of the hot tropical sun, and this is going to become relevant to us in a little, in a little bit in the talk. Um, the, well, wind up to a point, there are limits, and, and I say that you'll, you'll, you'll uh, understand later. Um, but you, natural systems, as they mature through the successional stages, uh, become increasingly, uh, they build natural capital, and they build natural capital for a reason, and then I'll call natural capital you know, soil and biomass and genetic information and ecosystem services for now to simplify it. But um, when you look at, I hate to use the word agenda, but there's a, there's a, a process that keeps happening in these natural systems, wherever, they, wherever you find them when they're mature. They build the natural capital and it's for an ability to withstand disturbances that are coming. And it's the only thing, and so this is why uh, resilience to me is the, is the key word. I used to use sustainability, but uh, I guess I'll just tell you now, in, in uh, 2001, a class five hurricane came along and flattened everything that I had been working on for 25 years, including this forest here for 20 miles in all directions. And so uh, two problems with sustainability in my mind are, if you really look at design, and if you have a functional reference point, you'd drop everything like a hot potato that you know about. You wouldn't want to try to sustain something so foolish. Right, so that's the first problem. The second problem is you're not going to be able to sustain it. It will get knocked down. The interesting thing, though, is if you have a lot of natural capital, uh, it can get back up uh, relative to not having it anyway. So what happened here was uh, after I had been doing this polyculture that was mimicking this and had equal amounts of carbon, had equal amounts of, of diversity, really. There were different species. We did mapping of, of birds and uh, looked at, so five species of cats were in this jungle, but also using our farm. It's a really nice buffer between intensive human land use and protected core areas. Uh, anybody familiar with the Biosphere Reserve, uh, Man in the Biosphere Program, UNDP? Anyway, there, it's, it's the best I've seen in terms of real macro planning, of, of regional planning, where you identify the most biodiversity, the most sensitive areas, and you protect them. You call those core areas. Then you have these transition zones, uh, and then you have intensive land use, right? And so this type of agroforestry that, that uh, I'm talking about right now fits very nicely in between those two. It extends the habitat of the core area, the wild areas, but here you have this level of biodiversity that really is pretty close to equal in a lot of ways, uh, st stores about the same amount of carbon if you do it right. And um, I think it's part of this restoration that we need because 
The thing that I didn't mention before is that after you have these experiences in nature and it changes you fundamentally, my experience is what it, it often doesn't come to the surface, you know, but it's subconsciously a, a message that is writing in there that says, that was incredible, that's the most you know, amazing thing I've ever experienced, but they have to keep me out of that park in terms of me living there in order to sustain it. That message is that we destroy that level of integrity when it happens in the world. It are, almost it defines us at a certain point. So I feel like it's you know, our survival is dependent on this. And I think that you can trace most of the self-destructive behavior of people, and, and there's a lot of it, and it's, some is fast and some is slower. But I think you can trace it psychologically back to that type of knowledge, which, like, like I said, it's not conscious usually. So I feel like it's really a mandate to uh, restore these damaged habitats and have it be restored to a high level of biological function and diversity because we're there, not because we're kept out. It's, it's a pretty profound thing when you get down to it. Uh, but the five species of wild cats using, and, and this is a hard part for human managed land is to have the top predators intact without uh, being in, uh, you know, they ate the last, they, when I bought the property there were two cows. I didn't really want them. They got eaten by jaguars. I was kind of happy about it. The local, the local, the local folks that I was working with uh, weren't. I had to kind of keep it to myself. My neighbors lost 13 cows. Um, so, you know, it's not easy, you know, uh, coexisting with top predators when you are one of them. Um, and so, but I was thriving on this, having been studying wildlife uh, biology, and I really wanted to pull the, the stops out and say, what? What's the, what are the possibilities here? You know, how can we coexist with uh, virtually everything out there? Uh, and I kind of found that we can, up until the, the hurricane, anyway. And then, but uh, even then, I know what to do. It's just a matter you got to start over again, spend another few decades, and <laughs> so forth. Um, so in the forest, the nutrient cycling systems are so tight. You know, because there's no real good soil storage, you have incredible nutrient cycle. Once you've built that infrastructure, and, and it's, there's a rain of nutrients from birds and insects and, and such, but you get into these interesting relationships. And one of the things about mature systems in general is that they maximize symbiotic relationships. And so when it comes down to like examining our own relationships, you know, like, what are we? Uh, you know, there's, there's, uh, you know, there's parasites, there's symbionts, there's, you know, all these types of relations. And then you got to decide what do you want to be. Uh, and I'm not even sure what we are because a parasite is smart enough to not kill its host. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where we, where we really are. We're kind of an aberrant uh, thing there. Even diseases, that they, they, they tone down their, their deadliness as the population starts getting smaller. Uh, so there's a lot to think about there. But... Uh, this is an interesting one because the, the nutrient cycling of, of these tropical forests leans really hard on legumes for nitrogen. Uh, and most of the plants have secondary compounds to protect themselves from herbivores. This is an acacia species that has developed a symbiotic relationship with an ant species. Uh, and the ant is, uh, lives in these hollow thorns. They drill a hole and they, they live in, in the thorns. And the plant has these extra floral ne nectaries, little water fountains of sugar to feed the ants. And so in exchange, the ant will, uh, if you lean on this tree, even if you don't get hit by the, the thorn, you will get some seriously hot bites that are like on par with a bee sting. Um, they'll be all over you now. Or even if a tendril of a vine wraps around it and starts to try to climb on it, they bite it off and drop it. So they, these guys work together. There's another ant species that um, cuts leaves and, and composts them and grows fungal gardens underground. And they can strip a whole tree in, in a night. It's, it's amazing. Watch them. They, they can beat down a pathway with a six-inch wide path that, you know, has got some depth to it. Uh, and they, the fungus that they grow and eat has lost its ability to make spores. So it's reliant on the ant to grow these gardens out and keep moving its, um, its spawn around. So... Um, Anyway, lots of this goes on too long to keep going on. I just wanted to make the point about symbiosis. 
So we did some uh, monitoring of, of bird diversity and did some tagging and looked at the reuse of how many birds were coming back and using these habitats and what was the diversity in uh, cultivated, I mean, not, it's hardly you could say cultivated, most people I know that have come, come back into the cacao uh, area of the farm think they're in the wildest Tarzan movie they've ever, they, they have a reference point for and yet everything is planted, everything is economic botany and it, it also crosses over into food for the, the, the birds and the big cats eventually uh, with the animals that are, that are living on it. Um, painted bunting, uh, this was a crazy <laughs> royal flycatcher. I went down to the net one morning, to check. it was my turn to, to check the net and this thing came out. It just looked like a little brown bird, like no big deal, but when I picked it up and was holding it, it, it just it flared this, this head thing out and it did this like really hypnotic eye deal and, <laughs> and he was moving his head back and forth like this and I, I, mean, I nearly dropped it because it was working on me. Uh, uh, beautiful. I mean, every time you take a walk you have these encounters with incredible things. Uh, three species of toucans is in a molly apple tree which is a fruit tree. Uh, this is cacao. Uh, it is a one leaf found about 20 miles back in the jungle. It's a remnant from the original Mayan chocolate uh, back in the day. And it is a white Criollo cacao, which is the rarest type. Wait, they, you brought some of that with you? <laughs> uh, I should have. I, I have some, but not at this exact one. Now, this got knocked down in the hurricane. But I'm, I did collect some and plant them on the farm. I can't tell you if it's still there, but uh, it's in the area. Anyway, cacao is a magical superfood and uh, just the most amazing food plant, I think. Uh, more to say on that. Yeah, there's lots of stages uh, of the uh, of harvesting these things and there's probably ten different stages between picking and breaking them open and uh, fermenting them and drying, peeling, <coughs> roasting, then making uh, coconut cream and um, the honey that you get, I, I keep bees there too, and we have this little bee that's a stingless bee that's tiny, 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 it's, uh, it doesn't sting. And uh, you can keep them right in your kitchen in gourds and, and hang them uh, below the, the thatch line and then go in with a tablespoon once in a while and take some out. So the best cacao drink I've ever had was coconut cream, uh, cacao, and this stingless trigona honey and um, vanilla that I have hand pollinated the flower and waited for it to, to get ready. Did you so, make any of that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I used to have to carry as much as I could to the airports and it was really funny because I'd, be, I'd have 150 pounds of assorted things. Um, and I would just, I got to the point, I used to like be a little sheepish going through customs and after a while I said, yeah, I got, I got everything on me, I've been on farms, you know, talk to me about it and they just eventually just like waved me through. But uh, I still have some cacao. This isn't a mango tree, this is the Fruit Loops toucan. So from the top of our highest hill, looking out, uh, there's a coastal plain, or these kind of waffle hills, or better soils. This is all Indian uh, reserve land. It's a kind of a cooperatively um, managed property. And they have a system of staking out where they're going to grow their crops each year uh, amongst themselves. And, and, and it's worked pretty well. However, the population density has gotten to the point where, um, so in a, in a couple slides I'll show you a, a rotation that I feel is required. If you have no inputs on this land, uh, you pretty much have to wait 20 years on, uh, at least in the hilly part, the bigger hills, to get the nutrients back in place. You know, we think about three to maybe eight year rotations on, on our farms. Um, I inspect organic farms over about half the country for about the last 26 years, so I get to see pretty much what everybody's doing on the temperate end as well. Um, but this is just looking over, and I have lots of friends who are farming out in, out in here, and they're, they're, they're pretty wonderful, but they're largely dominated by annuals now. In, in the crotches of those hills, you'll, you'll find these really nice, diverse food forests. Uh, but um, more and more, because it takes so long to walk, to get to a new rotation and back, and so many new you know, families are huge, so all these kids are going out and cutting their own when they get of age, and now the rotations are getting down to three years, and really not enough, and, and it's a bit problematic. Um, 
I was working on some strategies for, for that, and uh, there are some. So where, where I was going with it was um, <clears throat> mostly I was looking at the perennials and the fruits and, and so forth and, and these crazy diverse polycultures that jaguars are happy in. But in between, I would cut one to two acres a year for 20 years, one, one a year for 20 years. So you had one through 20 year regrowth, right? By 20, it's a, it's a, it's a young forest again. Uh, but there are these mosaic patterns. If you fly up and look over it, you get similar to what the native peoples were doing, and I'd like to talk about that too in all of this, is the use of fire in uh, pretty much you know, Australia, North America, all over. But indigenous peoples were using fire and creating this, these mosaic patterns by these small, cool burns often. It was the opposite of the kind of knucklehead Smokey the Bear fire suppression where you let the fuel load build up to where it's deadly to everybody once it catches fire. And, um, so there's this agroforestry model. So what you see up in here is the permanent cacao polyculture. And then around, you know, in among that, all the way around it, are these little one to two acre blocks that we, there's corn in there that we were growing that year. I'm standing on the edge of another one that is maybe two or three years old. And by the third, two or three years, you, you planted um, a few perennials that's continue to bear like you know papayas and plantains and things like that so you just kind of go back through there and harvest but you let it go um, there's a lot of dynamics going on here in terms of what's being mimicked and, and so by say year eight uh, regrowth next to a, a newer field next you know interfacing with uh, a hundred year growth uh, you're going to get certain species of butterflies that are like working on the plants that are that age. And uh, this habitat thing, the way it works is you get proportionally more life at the edges and the interfaces between um, different types of habitats. And so you want mixed age, mixed species stands, and you want openings within it, and you're simulating light gaps of big trees falling or uh, a lot of other you know, natural openings, and, th and that's where you're getting like off the charts levels of diversity. And, and there's good examples in the Amazon and other places where there's uh, as much or more diversity in places of human habitation uh, that are managed this way. So we have these possibilities. Um, lots of carbon being stored in lots of ways. I mean, the genetic information of selection of these plants are another piece of, in a way of, of carbon storage. You're storing it in DNA, and relevant DNA is it's adapting to that place. Um, let's see. So here's one that's maybe two, at least two years into the rotation where uh, build a bush camp over barely on the right. You'll see one in a minute. And then like when the rice is harvested, <laughs> thresh the rice in there and then take the, the plant mulch from the rice and put it all the way around the building and then plant sweet potatoes into it and chili peppers and you know, maybe 30 different species. And then and continue to harvest them, at least right around the bush camp. Maybe the rest of the plot has gone to other things. But um, this is all with, with nothing but machete, machetes, no zero inputs. Uh, like I said, it's, it's a whole different deal. This is a shot of cacao, understory, uh, principal interest. Uh, this is in a bush camp. You see the corn um, stacked like firewood, and these clusters are sesame. There's a baby hanging in the shade. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we were harvesting chilies, and some of the uh, women were working that day. Uh, I had developed these relationships with people who um, kind of cooperatively grew these things. But I was gone for a number of months, so. Uh, we would grow them on our property and then split the food because I'd get 20, 30 people at a time. And over years, I had to plant and plant and plant. You know, in the early years, it was like, okay, we got enough coffee for a few people, but these one group came in and stripped us out. So I had to build up stocks of, of all the crops to be able to handle. When you got 20 or 30 people for three meals a day for up to two weeks at a time, you go through some food and you can't just like go to the store. <laughs> it's a 20-mile trip. You've got to go down river in a dugout canoe, get on a bus at 6 in the morning, and it's a total pain in the ass. So you need to throw it yourself, and you're down there flagging people down on the river who are going by, what do you got, what do you got, what do you got, and you're coordinating all the ingredients from the landscape. Um, <clears throat> How many languages, which languages did you learn? 
Uh, it is, um, I didn't really speak them, but I had to botanically to get to ethnobotanical information. There's Mopan and Kechimaya being spoken, English, Spanish, then you had to get to Latin. Uh, if you want to get access to the information on plants, you kind of have to eventually get to Latin. Uh, where are we? So, again, uh, the sun is so intense there that we had to make these shades on some of the annual garden beds. And uh, you have to have a real strategy to get past it because he, you know he'll burn everything up in a, in a few days if you're if you're not careful. Um, and so these were some gardens we're doing that area to the back. I had like gravity fed uh, spring catchment systems and gravity fed showers for the people that were coming, and then these gardens, and then you can see bananas and coconuts and probably 30, 40 species of perennial fruits and going up the hill and um, like. Uh, the spring water also ran through a place to wash your clothes and, and whatnot. But um, so this is a kind of hard to tell example of uh, planting leguminous trees on contours and basically growing biological terraces, where you grow the nitrogen-fixing plants that create shade for the cassava and bananas and another you know 30 species of, of different types of semi-perennial beans and, and uh, whatever else we wanted. And you uh, <clears throat> then let the, the shade grow up in the legumes. You're getting nitrogen fixation laterally, and you're getting shade to protect them. And then when the rain starts, you can cut the legumes. And so uh, you can cut the tops off and then use them to weave in between the, the stumps. You leave the stumps, and then they re-sprout. And then you can pick between whether you want four or one, if you want bean poles, if you want firewood. I was also doing like cutting them and then leaving one every 10 feet and then girdling it and leaving it stand and then planting uh, chayotes and yams and other things at the base and they'll use that structure to climb on and then when it's time to harvest it, you dig the yam and then you cut your fuel wood for the kitchen uh, to cook it. Uh, and then by then you're, you're got your new sprouts and you know keep going like that and it stabilizes the you know, erosion going down slope. Um, well, like I said, everything you know is made with a machete. This is a, a sugarcane press, and there's probably five species uh, of, of tree in this. The hardest wood is the are the gears. This is the Sweetia panamensis. It's um, the bark of which is used for diabetes. And um, then there's the inner bark of, well, there's a rope, I think, this time. But they also lash things together with inner bark and such a lot. But uh, you make your tools with your tool. You have one tool, you make your other tools with it. You cut yourself a ladder when you go to cut the, <clears throat> the thatching for a house. So we built this, this building uh, when we started getting enough students to where we couldn't really do it in little huts anymore. And uh, it was really interesting. So from bottom floor we, we hand poured cement um, posts and, and cement floors which had to be hauled in the gravel and the sand and the cement had to be bought 20 miles away, put in a truck, dumped on the river, pulled up river and dug out a canoe, mixed and, and poured and, and, and hauled up the, the hill by on, on our backs which is almost everything uh, moved around the same way. But uh, then the second floor was kind of like a regular framing and then the, the top from the second floor up is all pretty much ancient Mayan, uh, thousands of years. Uh, we, everything had to be cut at the right time of the moon. Things will last a function of 10 times longer if you do it that way. Not 100% sure all the reasons, but probably sugar contents that vary depending on cycles. And then the insects will go after it if the sugar content is high. I'm not 100% sure, but it, it happens. And so you can you, you can ignore it at your own peril. You know, you have to repatch again in 18 months instead of 10 years. It, it's uh, it's a hell of a lot of work. Uh, but it was really wild watching this get lashed. So the, the vines had to be cut a full day's hike into the jungle and brought back and soaked in the river. And uh, you know, it just processes it to everything. But it, it just kind of looked like you're inside of a whale when you're up in, in this thing as it was forming like a giant basket. And then the, the leaves we thatched it with are over 20 feet long for one and they get split down the middle and they have like a, an, a, a, cup, a cupped nature to it and split down the middle and, and you know, overlap them with the cups up so they drain water and then they get uh, tied going up and you can see how it was um, 
blue sky that day, but we were kind of nervous because, you know, as we got up to maybe here or so, uh, we had just put a tongue and groove floor in. We didn't want it to get wet, and the clouds rolled in, and it started rain. Put it poured, and we got the last leaf on that day. Um, but yeah, so the other thing to say here is that I, I talked about the um, the cooperative, the, the leverage of cooperative uh, systems. And so down there, a lot like the Amish, you know, if you have a, a, a roof to thatch or a bean field to plant or whatever you've got as, as an individual and you don't have tractors and technology, you get 20 people to show up that day and then their wives come and they make a huge meal for lunch and everybody gets it all done and then after that that person owes those 20 people a day of work so there's no money changes hands it's it's a it's a pretty powerful economic model that we could learn from so the dugout canoe and the tr big trees fell we would make use of them after the hurricane we had a lot um, <clears throat> but uh, not many people knew how to make the you can see that same leaf that we were stashing. You take the leaves off it and then use it to, to, to guide the shape of the, the ads work when they're cutting in that. Um, just fascinating to watch you know, these, what, what can be done. So here we were pulling the, probably a mile. We, we hauled that, that dugout canoe through the jungle for, for about a mile. It was kind of funny. and a couple of bottles of rum. And uh, <laughs> we'd, be, we'd be pulling and pulling uh, up a slope. And you'd look back and some joker would be sitting in the boat like <laughs> waiting for somebody to figure it out. Uh, but uh, yeah, this is coming. You can see a cacao pod here. So this is all a cacao polyculture back in there. That's, this is after all those ferment, you know, cutting and, and breaking and fermenting and drying and uh, I think that's been roasted. So it's ready to put in a grinder and there's 60 60 percent cocoa butter in them. You know, when you get cocoa powder, they've taken out the, the fat so it can be sh you know good shelf life. And uh, but it's really amazing. You put this when it's warm in a grinder and you crank it all the way down and it just melts coming out of there. And, uh, it is a, it's a potent drink. I mean, the locals that work hard prefer cacao every time over coffee uh, because you get real energy from it to work. You know, coffee gives you this boost and then you have a crash. Um, not so with cacao. Um, this is coffee in a uh, mortar and pestle. Another tool made with just local tools and so it needs to be beaten because it has a, you know, after you, you pick the berry and you pulp it, you take the outer cherry off and then you dry it and then it still has another hull on it so you have to beat it and winnow it and then roast it and then grind it and make coffee so it's uh it's a kind of an education so i you know i was running these classes through here and um for years and they, you know they were getting a full indoctrination uh, and basically being taken away from all everything they were used to and then reconnected with where everything comes from and all these processes for everything and uh, and then for the first week, they would get connected to everything in their lives. And then the second week, we'd go back in that deep jungle backpacking and connect them back with where everything comes from. And there were, we literally came from as primates. And uh, pretty powerful transformational things I was seeing. I, I kept telling myself I would get better results. The results were excellent. But I kept telling myself that we'd get better and better results with better information. And it became kind of clear to me that something was holding the whole thing back that wasn't about information anymore. And years later, <clears throat> it took me, uh, that's kind of how I wound up in this group, is that uh, conversations with Jerry Brunetti, for those of you who knew him, uh, we kind of went deep into what's really going on in the cell and the mitochondrial uh, energy in the cell. And it, it basically became clear to me that what's going on here is uh, the energy levels are, have been dropping uh, methodically as the nutrition of the food has been dropping, as the soil has been eroded, as the preparation of the food has dropped. Uh, like this corn, for example, uh, I'll pass some of these, some of these around. Uh, if you grind and make cornmeal, you're going to get a different nutritional profile, even though it's way cranked up in terms of nutrition. But if you cook it in an alkaline, uh, like lime or ashes, the hominy, you're 
crowd familiar with making hominy or uh, nixtamalization for making tortillas and tamales. Uh, you get niacin and extra calcium and zinc and copper. It's, it's amazing. It's about how you cook it. And so uh, there's this like perfect storm of all these issues. And we haven't got to glyphosate and, and other things yet. But um, you have this situation where people's, and, and plus the bad fats, you know, that was, uh, that was another piece. We got sold on really bogus information about vegetable oil and, uh, you know, hydrogenated oils. And it just trashed the cell wall strength and the energy, that little energy that was still left in all that food and mitochondrial energy was leaking out of the cell walls. And, and so I was seeing in people this, in, this initial, you know, light up like a light bulb when there's, there's you know, here's the answers, here's, here's what we can do. Uh, but then a trillion cells are telling them, I don't even know how I'm going to get through the week. I don't have the energy to do what I'm doing. How can I retool everything and, and retrain my, all my habits and so forth? And, and then they glaze over. And so that, to me, one of the bottlenecks here is how do we get the work that we know to do done with um, who? We got less than 2% of the population farming. The average age is in their 60s. We don't even have a good plan for how to replicate those less than 2%. Uh, there was about 95% of the population farming when I got here. So the question is, you know, how many farmers do we really need to distribute into small holders? Most of the world is being fed by uh, small farms, is despite the hype of all this uh, industrial agriculture. It's only about 25%, and it's just making those people sick. Uh, and most of it's going to waste, and, and so on. So we've been sold a bad set of ideas, and uh, uh, it's still a bit of a question. You know, how do we, we really need some creative uh, thinking about land tenure. How do we access land for younger people? How do we get out of debt? How do we get, you know, on the land with the skill sets and the tools and, and the whole thing to, to, to really get this done? Uh, so we, we can discuss that. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of good things emerging but there's still a big need for trying to figure out how to, how to make this happen in the time frame that it looks like we probably have. Um, I, I like the idea of the nutrient meter, but I feel like we're rapidly coming to a point where we're not going to have the luxury to, to you know, argue about quality. If you don't have any food at all, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a moot point. Uh, uh, well, the reason I put this here, uh, Richard Alley, a couple of years ago at PASA, at the PASA conference in Pennsylvania, he's the climate researcher that uh, put this together. But you can see right here where we've, where we're, you know, really up. It's actually over this now. It's up 400 parts per million. But you can go back 600,000 years, and, and you don't even get anything to there, right? Uh, the implications of this are huge. But the one, the only thing I really want to say right now about it is that uh, for the last 10,000 years, uh, we, that's our agricultural history. Uh, we have not adapted our agriculture to anything but this incredibly mild period of weather that's as mild as anything we can see looking back. And we just pretty much trashed the option of having that kind of a mild weather. So we, we've got to have an agriculture that can endure a whole lot more extremes than we're already seeing. And we're just getting into it, right? <clears throat> so uh, I want to talk about the potential of, of what, um, let's get out of there, uh, <laughs> uh, this stuff is somewhat, um, you know, folks probably know most of this already, but uh, the thing to take from this slide is the, uh, the number here about soil. Uh, we can put that problematic carbon in the soil and, and have it serve everything very nicely. Uh, and also in the biomass, plant biomass, um, there's a lot we can do. There's a lot of bare ground. The lowest hanging fruit is just to reforest it, just to plant trees and let it take care of itself. That takes less energy to maintain, and it, it, it's that, that's the first part. Um, the next level of efficiency is going to be kind of in the agroforestry and grazing part. Uh, with, don't really have to go into the soil food web with you folks. You've just gotten quite an education on that. But this is really where the foundation of the solution is. In order to really make it work, I do think we have to look at the, at the, uh, uh, the 
botanical architecture above the soil and, <coughs> and really look at what we, what we can learn from that tropical system or our, for our mature forests here. Um, there's much deeper pumping from the trees, the roots that will reach much further down, it'll sequester carbon down where it's going to be, the, you know, the, it'll take the longest to get back into the atmosphere. Um, but uh, this is the work that we're doing here. I don't explain it to this group. I, I was trying to bring the tree stuff in um, because I think it's not being talked about so much, the perennials in general. So when you stand back from natural systems and you look at what they're doing, that's what I tend to do, um, you know, what the tendencies of these systems are. Um, you know, for example, try to find a, um, try to find an annual ecosystem or even a, even a, any natural ecosystem that has more than about 3% annuals in it, uh, you're, you're just not going to find it. And there's reasons for that. You know, the annuals play a really important role. They're fast growing. They can quickly heal a wound that gets opened up. Uh, but to have landscapes that are annual as far as you can drive in a day across North America is purely unnatural. And uh, it's going to take a lot of energy to maintain. And that's, this is where this 10 to 20 calories of energy we're throwing away. So we have a real opportunity to, uh, well, this is just, this is Dr. Lau that's been quoted a bunch by uh, Dr. Jones and uh, others uh, I've heard. Uh, just showing the potential of the soil to, to absorb a lot of this uh, carbon, problematic carbon. Um, so in looking at legacies of, of, of human activity around the world, and I, I've looked at a bunch of them, I got nothing that comes anywhere close to this. Uh, people familiar with Terra Preta and the Amazon? Uh, it is uh, <coughs> mind-boggling to me because they're some of the poorest soils in the world and it's incredibly hard to get organic matter to stick around. So this is a feat beyond my imagination, really. I wouldn't have thought it was possible uh, if, it, if it didn't exist. And uh, it's based on charcoal, we know that, but we don't really know the mechanisms that they did to make it happen. And um, we'll, we'll talk about biochar here, but. Um, it's truly amazing. I, mean, I built compost piles seven feet diameter and six feet high and left for eight months and you could put the whole thing in a five gallon bucket and you got back. I mean, it, these warm, the reason why soils build up so well in the temperate zone is we got winter. It's dormant. It can't get warm enough to oxidize it as radically as it does in the tropics. So this durable carbon, uh, five, six, seven hundred years after the last people uh, did anything to generate them is just amazing. And I think that I mean, there's a lot of, I think, mixed information about biochar and charcoal. And I think a lot of it is kind of uh, not very well thought out. Uh, there's a way to get it right, I think. And uh, we're, we're working on that. But we really need to look at how to do translate this process into, say, a temperate zone. We need to get it into the carbon into the ground. So on top of all the best practices with agroforestry, with uh, grazing systems, amazing stuff I've seen on farms with grazing. Uh, Gabe Brown was mentioned. He's kind of at the top of the, the game. I was on a farm recently uh, that had gotten uh, three percentage points of organic matter in four years with the similar techniques in, in Ohio that Gabe Brown is doing. That is just phenomenal. But if we can do that and trees and layer in biochar and do a, you know, a little bit of all of the above, I think we can uh, rap rapidly accelerate uh, the, the direction that we really need to go quickly. So just trying to toss out the strongest leverage points I've encountered <coughs> for, for what we need to do. But uh, let's see, what else to say? Uh, I've got a biochar cohort here in the crowd. <laughs> if you, you can toss any information that you can think of out. But, uh, really quite extraordinary. What they found was clay pots, uh, and you know, it's obviously anthropocentric. I, maybe I didn't say that, or anthropogenic. It's <laughs> not centric. Uh, anthropogenic. They, uh, these are not natural soils. The one to the left is what's normally there. Uh, fairly poor soils, but even, uh, like I said, 600 years later, they're, they're worth five times as much on, on the, you know, the real estate market. And, uh, and they're incredibly fertile, with very high amounts of not just organic matter, but 
you know, active living carbon. There's a giant earthworm down there that's key in all of this in terms of the, uh, the earthworm casting piece of it. Because you have to load, you have, you've got to charge biochar, you've got to get lots of stuff into it. Or, it, you know, at least in the first year, if you try to dump it on raw, you're going to have a negative experience. Uh, well, these are all the mapped out points in the Amazon, and there's uh, an area the size of France. And uh, with the soil, which is just, again, mind-boggling off the charts as far as I'm concerned, uh, that this is possible. But I, I think it, it, it's something that we should be looking at very closely. Um, this is the micropore structure in, uh, so essentially when you're making charcoal, you're driving off the uh, oxygen and hydrogen, you're leaving the skeleton of the plant and the vascular system that it was, the xylem and phloem that it used to, to pump nutrients through, and it's got football field of surface area in about a tablespoon roughly uh, and that is um, a place it's almost like a coral reef for microbial life and so uh, it, it draws in um, mycorrhizal fungi they can reach into some of these pores where roots can't and uh, kind of well I guess I should this is a good time. <laughs> um, let me just run off some. How are we doing on time, by the way? Good? We have 15, 15 minutes. Total? Total. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. So, uh, anything important. so charcoal in the, uh, in the soil, uh, it'll increase aggregation, increase microbial biomass, soil tilt, porosity, cation exchange, water infiltration and retention, mycorrhizal fungi, pH, uh, at the front end, uh, it'll decrease ammonia, methane emissions, and nitrous oxide. Uh, it'll decrease leaching, decrease odors, flies, uh, and flies in barns and so forth. Uh, one pound of biochar equals three pounds of CO2 sequestered. Long-term carbon sink, two to eight thousand years. It looks like from archaeological digs and the, and the charcoal that you find in the fire pits. Um, gosh. Lots of uses. Uh, there's like, we did a two-day course, Dale and I, uh, and we went through at least 55 different uses, and it's it's pretty incredible. Uh, let's see, do we have time for it? Let, let's run through whatever I got left. And uh, so this is straw. You can make this out of a lot of things, not just wood. Uh, potential benefits. Uh, that's okay. Um, so for for livestock operations. Uh, Silage agent, uh, it'll protect cows from mycotoxins if you're feeding silage, which I don't necessarily recommend. Um, feed additives, uh, supplement, litter additives, slurry treatment, manure, composting, water treatment, and fish farming in the soil. It's carbon fertilizer, a uh, good compost additive, peat alternative in potting soil, plant protection, trace fertilizer, you know, so you can you can load your traces into this stuff when you're doing your soil. Uh, you can use it for insulation and in building, air decontamination, decontamination of earth foundations, humidity regulation, protection against electromagnetic radiation. Sorry for talking fast. Um, in remediation, there's uh, soil remediation, wastewater cleaning, um, pesticide and herbicide barrier trenches can be uh, put at the sides of fields and waterways and many other applications for uh, remediation. Uh, in biogas bio, uh, gas systems, uh, biomass additive, biogas slurry treatment, it increases methane yield and it decreases CO2 and ammonia, uh, increases the nutrient in, uh, nutrients in the slurry for agricultural use in the end. Wastewater treatment, active carbon filter, pre-rinse additive, soil substrate for plant beds, composting toilets that works excellent in, uh, micro and urinals, uh, drinking water, uh, micro filters and macro filters, miscellaneous exhaust filters, room air filters, industrial carbon fibers, plastics, electronics, semiconductors, batteries, metal reduction, metallurgy, cosmetics, soaps, skin creams, bath additives, paints, Food colorants, energy pellets, lignite substitute, uh, medicine detox, pharmaceutical carrier, fabric additive, 
the thermal breathing properties, odor reduction, mattress filling, pillow filling, electromagnetic radiation shield. Uh, I mean, it'll literally pull ele electro smog out of the room if you stucco these walls with it. Uh, you know, in other words, sw swapped out the sand component, put biochar in it, and it'll pull out those Wi-Fi signals and things that are scrambling our Schumann resonance. Uh, uh, that's a whole other topic. Um, enough there. Um, so, that's thermal potential back to the natural. This is a World Bank statement on natural capital. We've kind of covered that. Um, it, it's worthy of, uh, of noting like the potential for uh, currencies to be backed up by actual capital and maybe we would have a chance. Um, let's see. Yeah, so these are just basic things on natural capital, I'm going to have to move. So this, I was talking about succession and all those tendencies I think I mentioned, um, you know, that, okay, they're dominantly, per, as you get from here, bare rock to here, as you get on this end, mm -hmm. the tendencies you see are that they become dominantly perennial, genetically rich polycultures, high in biomass, they conserve water and quality, they conserve and build topsoil, maximize symbiotic relationships, moderate climatic extremes, have an efficient use of on-site energy, complex, uh, complex nutrient cycling, everything has multi-functions multi at this end. So we can emulate this, that's, that's the point. Um, so these are some of the, the ways that we can emulate it. With uh, forest farming, I'm getting involved in growing medicines in the forest. I was asked to do not just organic certification, but forest grown certification for ginseng and forest botanicals. It's, it's another, okay, I gotta get to this sweet spot. So <laughs> uh, when the forests are at a mature state, they taper off on their carbon sequestration. Maybe not all the way, but enough to get a bigger, a bump of carbon sequestration. If we go in and we were to take off, say 20%, at the right 20%, do what the, the native peoples were doing with fire, with the, with the cool burns often, they were creating an environment that was really open underneath, not quite like that, but bigger trees, nut bearing trees. Uh, for ungulates, the grasses would come in at that thinness and the nutrients would go up and then uh, they would work in tubers and uh, but lots of wildlife habitat and nut production by thinning it. And so we can emulate this not by burning, I think, because of the number of people and the CO2 problem, but we could pull out 20%, say, get the whole forest to sequester carbon again, and then um, take that wood, grate it out into lumber, into mushroom logs, take the rest of it as feedstock to run through what I need to definitely get to, which is this combined heat power biochar. If anybody's interested in seeing it, it's on the table over here. It's coming out in May, I'm working with some uh, engineers who have kind of hit the holy grail as far as some of us in the biochar world have uh, are concerned where you're getting electric electricity, you're getting hot water, you're getting space heat, and then you wind up with charcoal. Mm -hmm. So this is really getting interesting because that this is the first renewable energy that's really carbon negative. If, you, if you're honest about solar, and I've been off the grid for 37 years, and I've got hot, solar hot water, solar electricity, this beautifully fits the, uh, the gap in the winter time when, you're, when it's lean. So we could be, uh, backing up those solar panels when it's you know cold and dark in the winter and the snow is on the panels and so forth. What are you releasing in May? Uh, I'm not releasing it, but the, the people I'm working with have this this uh, combined heat power biochar. Unit. Would it be a unit? Uh, it or is it's not, it's purchasable. It's purchasable, it, it, in May it will be. Really? I'm gonna be getting one and I'm really? trying to get as many uh, research projects that have a lot of students and, and people exposed to it that have greenhouses and composting operations and just link it up nicely and uh, because the hot water heat exchanger can be run through germination beds and things like that and uh, lots of potential there but let's keep moving so yeah the silvo pastoral the, you know this situation here on a 90 degree day when it's been really hot for weeks and no rain these animals are going to be grazing all day long um, and when there's no trees in that model, they're gonna be on the edge of the field panting on the ground somewhere. Um, probably laying on the only grass that's still growing. And 
you guys know about right? riparian zone buffers and alley cropping, uh, windbreaks. See, okay, we don't have time to talk about that. So alley cropping has got uh, these will will also weather you know hot dry weather much better and get a total yield of whatever the tree crop is. Essential here is to plant trees into existing agriculture and into existing pastures to hydrate them and uh, get them to be uh, productive in this coming weather, uh, more resilient. Cover that. So lots of possible ways to do all this, integrating animals and tree crops and, and coppicing straight rows that you, you put in. Uh, to generate your feedstocks this way. It's easier, actually, because if you have straight rows, you can get the tractor in there and the chipper and so forth and, and get your feedstocks going. Uh, these are the, some of these, uh, this is golden seal being grown under a canopy. So you've gone in and taken out some of that, that heavy shade and create, you know, gotten your, your electricity and your hot water and your space heat and your biochar, and then you're left with this nice environment to go in and start planting a wide range of medicinals and foods, uh, nut trees. Um, mushrooms are really potential there. So this is ginseng and golden seal and bloodroot. Uh, getting quite involved with that right now. I'm on the advisory board of the United Plant Savers with people who know that organization working with conservation of medicinal plants that are being over harvested or under cultivated. Uh, we have been covering that here for days, the root secretion. This is a magic piece of the puzzle, mycorrhizae and uh, liquid carbon pathway, huge. Um, okay, wow. mycorrhizae, not mycorrhizae, That's night and day. Anybody familiar with Keyline? This is another very powerful tool for, uh, you know, it's kind of energy intensive, but it's incredible what can be done with it. You can actually be dropping in biochar, loaded biochar in behind it, and all kinds of other, uh, you know, pieces. But basically, you're, you're ripping on contour, you're going down into the subsoil, you're allowing water, uh, air, and uh, temperature to get, to penetrate into that zone of subsoil that can be Grown, that you can increase the biological zone very, very quickly. People have gone from five inch active soil to 18 inches in five years. You know, with, and the way that you do that, you can see how you know, the different years and how deep you go. You only set it into that subsoil a little bit each time. You don't go all the way at once. Uh, it's base, it's uh, take a little too long to probably talk very much about, but it's involving creating a bunch of pocket dams high in the landscape making swales and ripping these contours uh, along. Where you're, you're taking the water from where it goes from convex to concave and where it starts running over land and you're taking it out to the dry ridges and you're allowing the water to infiltrate. It's a little uh, more challenging in our New England rocky soils than your Ohio soils. We've had uh, a demonstration workshop up in our county. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, the, you know, it, it, it's going to take, it's it's gonna take a lot <laughs> to get it to, to work right. This is in Chiapas, you know, coffee and then little small holdings. You can imagine what we're not going to have time for is the resilience that I was hoping to get to about distributed generation. If you've got enough people growing enough food locally and storing it, that in these events that come, nobody has to go running to the stores and stripping the shelves and keeping the people without uh, better means from having anything. It's that people are um, really part of a problem if you're not producing you know, with this one and a half percent of the population growing food, we need to crank that way up. It's, it's really our responsibility to generate more production, more producers, less consumers. Uh, uh, biomimicry, this is a train design and it's much more efficient based on the head of a uh, kingfisher. Cooling of large buildings as with uh, termite mounds as a, as a uh, analog. <laughs> Uh, this is my place, integrated trees and vegetables, and uh, I've got you know, a bunch of mushrooms out here and all kinds of medicinals in the woods and then bigger fields right next to it. I've got a little pond that irrigates the top two acres. I'm in a kind of hidden valley. Uh, blueberries, raspberries, cover crops. Um, yeah, so there's a little pond, 18,000 gallon pond. It, it irrigates the whole thing. I've got springs from this side of the hill that run into it, gravity and feed. I can run water from the roof, I can pump water out of a well, and I can pump 
water from the creek. So uh, it's a holding uh, holding pond, but I've had wood ducks and herons and all kinds of animals come in. When you increase the habitat, they will come. Beehives, uh, anyway. Uh, oh yeah, I was gonna pass, I don't know if we have time to pass these around, but this gets into the genetics and some of the stuff we're doing with uh, some of these BFA protocols and uh, growing amazing epigenetic seeds. This is a calico popcorn that I grew years ago. This is this corn here in the field. Uh, we're having amazing results with the paramagnetic, paramagnetic rock powders and cover crops. Uh, this is a community staple food, uh, like a micro food shed, 10 houses. I got. I used to do farmers markets and contract growing for baby food companies and seed growing contracts with seeds of change and others, but I'm finding it very liberating to be outside of the economics of commodities. Uh, it's, uh, it's kind of like artists I've talked to that were trying to make a living on their art and they got, it wasn't fun anymore. Some ancient varieties of grains. This is a turkey red. Uh, we've got a little combine and we're playing with a lot of different cover crop seeds and, uh, and grains and dry beans. These are three different types of dry beans. This is just for the 10 households on the community land trust where I live. So this is a food security system. Uh, this slide. So this had, I don't know if people are familiar with carbonatite, but uh, this row had not very much carbonatite. It was like less than a bag. And this eventually grew over the top of the non-carbonatite row. 35 feet of this got five and a half bushels of big uh, nutrient dense dark orange butternuts. This got three, so it's almost doubled the yield with just that mineral alone. Uh, cover crops, pumpkins. We're growing these naked seeded pumpkins and uh, love them. They're amazing high zinc, uh, as, as much nutrition as almost any nut, and easy to just bust a pumpkin open and reach in and grab handfuls of phenomenal food without having to do anything, no hauling. Wow. What pumpkin is that? Uh, it's a lady Godiva. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> there's others. Um, yeah, yeah, apples get to themselves. A lot of, I grow a lot of shiitake mushrooms, peaches. We do the BFA table at the Paw Paw Festival, and this is just the table wing uh, there. We hosted this Ogun tractor, uh, open open source tractor that they built for Cuba, but it's everything's off the shelf. There's no uh, proprietary parts. What's the name uh, of it? Ogun, O-G-G-U-N. This is a friend who uh, uh, adapted a, uh, an old Alice Chalmers G tractor to electric. Uh, biochar workshop, we kind of talked about that, but uh, this is a wild man, uh, Gary Gilmore from Pennsylvania. He, he showed up with all these gadgets and we had a lot of fun. You know, we were running walk behind tractors with the charcoal, you can gasify it, I didn't mention that. Uh, different types of cookers, um, gasifier, forward in that tractor and generators. Had a lot of fun, we'll probably do it again. You can see this is the Beverly Hillbillies Gravely. <laughs> <laughs> It has a, a, a thing to grind and spread the biochar in the field as you're going. It's running on biochar, too. <laughs> so this time of year, uh, this is why I'm so excited about this combined heat power biochar deal, because my solar panels are covered in snow, and the hot water is covered in snow. I heat with wood. Uh, so it's very relevant to be able to make power and then store them. So here's the other piece of the equation. These are. Uh, a new type of battery. It's a saltwater battery. I've been waiting for decades for something to evolve, and it finally has. Really? Amazing. I could go on for a while on these. This is the combined heat power biochar. It runs on a Stirling engine, takes wood pellets, wood chips, rice hulls, potentially other things, and makes a thousand watts of electricity continuously to charge those batteries and back me up there. It has a heat exchanger, makes hot water, and uh, you can use that for your domestic hot water or heating. And then it has about... Two-way hot water? Two-way heat exchanger or one-way? Well, it goes from a glock power loop that cools the engine just like in a vehicle, and then it has a, uh, a fresh water uh, uh, loop that grabs the heat. Uh -huh. um, leaves you with 17% biochar. If people are interested, come to the table out there. I've got handouts on it. And that was it. So... <laughs> Thank you.
be a lot of people want to talk. I think we've run out of time. You guys probably want to eat, uh, but I'll be circulating around and maybe at the table a little bit out there. Thanks for coming. Mark, what's the table? Uh, the Southeast Ohio uh, chapter, not the BFA chapter. Okay. 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 Yes.